Okay. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the uh, Open Infrastructure Community Meeting. Um, a reminder that this is a quarterly meeting. Um, this next one will be in September. So if you have questions along the way, please uh, throw them into the chat and we will try to address them if there is additional time. Um, so let's get started. Uh, the agenda, uh, first up, we've got the OpenStack Foundation project updates uh, from all of our uh, premier projects. And then um, secondarily, we've got some event updates from our, uh, about the PTG, OpenDev, and the Open Infrastructure Summit. So first up, uh, the OpenStack project updates. We'll start with OpenStack. And speaking will be Gansham Man. Yeah, hi, thanks, Jimmy. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, from OpenStack side um, uh, on the project updates, we have the three things to share. First is the project retirement. Uh, we did the retirement for the two projects. One is Congress and one Tricircle. Uh, the TC has uh, retirement criteria now, like uh, PTL is one of them, and we didn't have any PTL candidate for uh, Congress and Tricircle project in uh, Victoria Cycle. And as per their development, also not going uh, active in new series cycles. So we decided to uh, retire these two Congress, uh, Congress and Tricircle project. So the retirement is completed. And uh, if there is any activity com comes up, uh, they can continue the development under the open dev and they can reapply for the OpenStack official project. And other update on re retirement is we did some uh, process clarification on retirement also. And uh, we found like there are many projects which were retired uh, previously are not cleaned up properly. So the cleanup process is also ongoing in TC. Next is uh, Victoria Cycle uh, goals. So we have selected uh, two goals for Victoria Cycles. Uh, one is uh, migrating CICD jobs to Ubuntu Focal uh, 20.04 version. And that uh, uh, goal is being started. We are preparing the dev stack jobs first, and then in parallel, we will be testing the uh, projects, uh, project uh, CICD also. So once we confirm everything is uh, working fine, then we will move the dev stack and Tempest jobs by default to the focal. Second is uh, migrating the Zool, uh, Zool legacy jobs to Zool v3 native. And uh, Toski is uh, champion for this. Uh, he's driving the effort on that. Uh, the work in this is we have the legacy, we still have the legacy jobs in OpenStack and we are trying to move it to Zool v3 since many years. But uh, this cycle we are deciding to go with the goal, community goal. And uh, if we can finish it, it will be a big relief for, in terms of the maintenance, uh, it will be a big relief for all the projects and even uh, infra or peer team. So these are the two final goals and uh, next cycle goals will be starting soon. On the release side, uh, milestone one is being done last week. And uh, if you have seen the Sony email on or the mailing list in OpenStack that discuss, uh, we have the like release cycle deadlines. So each project uh, should follow those, all those things, all the milestone guidelines and updates. On community updates, uh, as everyone knows, we finished the virtual PTZ, our first virtual PTZ for Victoria Cycle. You can find all the Etherpad here, and uh, we have the blogs also from Kendall on summary of uh, TC and project site. And you have Etherpads, you can have the summary emails from projects on mailing list also. And it was overall, it was a great success. And we discussed a lot of uh, technical topics to be finished in Victoria Cycle. And participation was much more than the physical PTGs. So it's really great. Second big thing we did from community update wise is technical committee and user committee. Uh, so we must uh, these two uh, committee into a single governance body. And the paths we linked here is also merged in governance. So uh, the technical committee 
which has 11 members now. So they will be uh, serving as user committee also, or you can say the user committee also is a part of that technical committee. We have the new charter also available uh, to clarify like what are the responsibility and how we will um, how we will go man, uh, plan these both communities to work together. So there is there and Terry did all this work and thanks to him. That's all from OpenStack side. If you have any question, yeah, you can address in chat. Uh, it's only addressing in chat or can we ask? Mm, I'm not sure, maybe okay. time permit, Jimmy. Yes. Uh, Prakash, if you could put your questions in the chat, uh, we will, um, I, I think we'll handle them at the end if we have time. Um, awesome. Um, yep. Hi, everyone. Um, oh, sorry. Sunny side, everyone. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Um, as you might have heard of that, um, OpenStack is turning 10 this year. And to celebrate 10 years OpenStack on the birthday, July 19th, we'll be launching the campaign that includes many articles and blogs that are written from our committee members and ecosystem companies about 10 years OpenStack. Um, and as another part of the birthday campaign, we are planning to have a virtual celebration on July 16th with the community to celebrate the 10 years. Um, so as more details, details um, come up, I will be sending an email about it to the OpenStack mailing list. So please keep an eye on your email for more details on that um, committee meeting. And meanwhile, uh, we are also uh, launching the world, uh, world Runs on OpenStack, and this will be a series of case studies and interviews highlighting how OpenStack has um, impacted many things um, across the globe. Um, to participate in that, if you're interested in submitting a case study, um, please let me know, and um, that's my email, sunny at openstack.org. Um, at the very bottom. Um, so please uh, please reach out to me and um, and we can talk from there. And another action item to participate in the 10 years OpenStack is that um, please share your top 10 favorite moments or um, top 10 favorite anything with OpenStack by clicking that Bitly link. Um, and um, yeah, please share that with us. Uh, before the birthday July 6th, uh, July 19th. And um, yeah, we'll be very excited to hear from you. Awesome, thank you, Sunny. Uh, next up, we've got Airship. Uh, Alex Hughes is gonna be presenting. Hi, thanks. Uh, I'm one of the members of the Airship Technical Committee and just want to share a few updates from the Airship community, what's happened since we last met and what we're working on going forward. After Airship 1's success, we wanted to take the lessons we learned and make Airship more capable, more secure, more resilient, and most importantly, more comfortable to operate. So what do I mean by more capable? Well, we will support more use cases, expand the operational capabilities, and add more supported features. And to do all this, we started developing Airship 2 and split up some of these goals into milestones. Recently, the Airship community completed the alpha milestone, and one of the great success stories of that was deploying Airship 2 into a bare metal lab and demonstrating end-to-end -end provisioning workflow. Anyone interested can track the progress and availability of our upcoming beta release in GitHub issues. And each month, the technical committee provides a snapshot of this progress on our blog and in the newsletters. The Airship community wouldn't have made a, the progress that it has without frequent conversations with operators and developers. So earlier this month, we attended the virtual PTG, and we had a few key takeaways. Uh, we had higher participation than we usually do for in-person events. We made significant progress on secrets design, deployment configurations we want to support, and the Airship UI project. And there was also excellent cross-team collaboration with Starling X, Ironic, and the Edge Working Group. During our discussions with Starling X, we gave an update on Airship 2 and laid out the deprecation cycle for Armada. 
We also encourage them to check out the Flux Helm operator and look forward to more discussions and opportunities to align Starling X and Airship's uh, technical stacks in the future. Uh, the Airship Technical and Working Committees have been driving efforts to make Airship secure out of the box. Uh, to help us, we have adopted a formal vulnerability management process that's inspired by OpenStax process. This will be used to report and disclose vulnerabilities. And coming soon will be more automated processes to help developers ensure their code is free of security concerns with tools like Bandit, and that the resulting container images are free of CVEs with tools like Claire. To track all this work and to facilitate collaboration across projects, the Airship community adopted GitHub Issues. GitHub Issues has proven an invaluable tool, and we now host weekly grooming calls to scope work and discuss design considerations for each item. So I've talked a, a lot about the project, but the community behind Airship is essential. Uh, governance is governance by community elected officials is one of the cornerstones of the four opens. And last year we held our first elections for the technical and working committees. Earlier this month, we elected our second technical committee with leaders representing five different companies, uh, Accenture, AT&T, Ericsson, Mirantis, and for the first time, Dell. Uh, Dell's representation on the technical committee emphasizes the community's continued growth and commitment to diversity. And next month, we'll be holding our elections for the second working committee term. We've also launched the Airship User Survey. This gives users an, uh, evaluating a running airship an opportunity to provide anonymous feedback to help influence the community and software direction. We'll present the results of this survey at the fall summit. So these are just a few of the highlights of what's going on in the airship community. Uh, for some more frequent updates, I'd encourage you all to check out the blogs on airship.org. We're looking forward to delivering a more comprehensive update and announcing the release of Airship 2 at the fall summit. Until then, uh, thank you. And Jimmy, I'll pass it back to you. Thanks, Alex. Uh, next up, we've got uh, Kata Containers with uh, Eric Kearns. Hey Jim, thanks. <clears throat> um, so things continue to move forward with Kata. Um, you know, when we first started off, there was a lot of excitement and uh, you know, just different new enabling to highlight. Um, at this point, uh, things are nicely uh, boring. Uh, I would say um, we just last week had a, a couple of different releases uh, around 1.11 um, and just kind of some basic iterative uh, fixing and, and slight enhancements. Um, but I would say the majority of the community's focus at this point is around Kata 2.0. Um, and, you know, with doing a major release, it gives us a lot of flexibility to deprecate old things that, you know, we don't see uh, as necessary anymore and then kind of make more major changes in order to be able to um, better enable our end users. Um, so a few different examples out of that that I've highlighted here is that we went ahead and rewrote the agent um, in Rust. Uh, and the reason to do this isn't because Rust is an awesome buzzword, but it uh, is a bit more secure uh, generally as a language, but it, it is a lot lighter weight. So um, the agent is something that would run uh, closest to an end user's workload. So, you know, it, it is uh, from a surface standpoint, uh, maybe on the more sensitive end, and also since it's going to exist for every single uh, pod that's created, you know, having this uh, reduced in size as much as possible uh, is a big improvement from a footprint uh, for our end users. Um, and similarly, uh, make, making kind of similar changes, I, I suppose, in kind of 2.0. So it's, it's a lot of work um, for us, but we're kind of uh, have a lot of good momentum. Uh, we had the PTG, um, we participated at the beginning of the month and a lot of the discussion was around different features around uh, Kata 2.0. We continue to have a pretty uh, good mix of uh, contributors and, and people very active in the project. Um, and, and you know, it's a, it's a mix of some vendors uh, if you look at like uh, ARM, um, I'm at Ampere now, and you look at Intel, 
uh, you know, that's that's a good core uh, of the project, but pretty much everyone else is somebody trying to use it in production um, or manage, you know, a software offering in production. So uh, it's I think that that's been a pretty healthy balance um, and I'm happy to see that. We continue to hear uh, more folks who are using Kata in production, but less about, um, you know, handholding at this point um, because of the maturity of the project. Um, sometimes we just hear uh, via new features being added um, from, from different people, kind of detailing how they can customize Kata to, to meet their needs best, or just as a, hey, heads up, we're using it and it's been working well. Um, so, you know, we, I do have a link at the bottom of this for the Kata user survey. Uh, and that's, you know, um, more or less the, the way that we're trying to get more formal information on production numbers and kind of deployment sizes, things like this. But um, I would say that, you know, we're continuing to get more and more people using Kata in production. And once we have 2.0 out there, you know, and we continue developing 2.0, I think we'll be able to be more splashy, uh, I would say, for a little bit. But otherwise, things things are boring and things are being used and uh, continuing to iterate to be a better uh, project. Awesome. And, yep. Thank you, Eric. Thanks. Yeah. Boring is good. Boring is good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, all right. Awesome. Next up, uh, we've got a new initiative from the OpenStack Foundation. It's the Open Infra Labs. So we've got Michael Deitzman and Bill Burns up to talk about that. Yes. Hi, this, this is Bill Burns. Um, Michael and I have been trying to help uh, get this community going. It's a, uh, an effort to have a community centered around cloud operations. You know, not, not just OpenStack, but any, any particular cloud uh, components that open source co cloud components that people might want to use as a place where people can test code in production, uh, publish complete reproducible stacks to make it easier for other folks to stand up clouds, uh, you know, on existing and emerging workloads and uh, so forth. Uh, some of the things that have happened, it's really been gained traction over the last uh, six months uh, and still building. Uh, some of the things that we moved to GitLab because we got feedback from cloud operators that the uh, the traditional uh, uh, setup that uh, OpenDev uh, was really not uh, amenable to them. They're more used to Git, and so it's actually moved to a GitLab repository to make it uh, embrace the operator community. Um, we have an active discussion going on about monitoring needs for the cloud. Uh, for people running open source clouds without trying to use proprietary uh, cloud provider uh, infrastructure, you know, they need to be able to monitor the usage of the cloud. And one of the efforts that's kind of going on here is to develop some tooling to assist operators that would actually use AI. And so as AI ops uh, is something that needs uh, consistent monitoring to help uh, manage the cloud. Uh, the Mass Open Cloud uh, in, in Massachusetts and the New England Research Cloud, which are both having their architectures uh, defined as part of an open process in, uh, in the project up at Open Infra Labs. Uh, and uh, NERC is a new cloud that's uh, emerging and Mass Open Cloud is undergoing a, uh, an evolution from its uh, prior state. Um, and then I, I run an initiative at Red Hat. Uh, I work for Red Hat called Operate First. And the idea there is that we were trying to get engineers at Red Hat and in their upstream projects to be more focused on operations and how their code, functional code performs when it gets out into the cloud. And so we're part of this community and uh, the operators within Red Hat that run clouds are really excited to have an upstream where they can contribute uh, their tooling and, and uh, reference architectures, whatever, uh, and also share in uh, community, just like we do for regular projects at Red Hat. So it's a great thing. And there's also a project, Keras, that has been proposed that, that addresses distributed compute and distributed storage together from another party. And uh, the, the current uh, idea of Open Infra Labs is that it's, it's pretty wide open to embrace anything that touches upon operations and, and cloud operations in general, so that uh, it, it's not being restricted to a particular thing. It may not actually 
produce a, you know, an open infra labs release one or release two, it probably might be more ongoing with various tools and, and things to assist. There could be a prescription there for the latest OpenStack, you know, in use with, you know, projects X, Y, and Z. And then it could be a prescription in there for the, an older version of OpenStack with projects A, B, and C. And you could have, you know, uh, setups there that don't have anything to do with OpenStack, right? It's not limited to any one particular technologies. It's designed to be open and, and to provide the open source benefits to the operator community. So uh, we have a link here. And we're interested in any kind of communications and efforts. And uh, we have a chat channel on uh, Freenode called Open Infra Labs, where you can engage and also in the uh, upstream uh, Git repo. So that's Open Infra Labs. We're looking to build the community. Uh, great start so far, and uh, the more the merrier. So if anybody out there knows folks trying to stand up open source clouds, struggling by rolling their own, whatever, this is a great place to get people together to share their experiences and benefit from others. So, thank you. Excellent. Thank you. And next up, uh, Bruce Jones will be presenting for Starling X. Hello, thank you. Um, I'm Bruce Jones. I'm one of the Starling X TSC members. It's my pleasure to present to you today. So um, the biggest news from Starling X is we were just confirmed just a few weeks ago at the board of directors meeting for a full project. We're very, very pleased and grateful for the support of the foundation. Um, we're working toward our 4.0 release right now. Um, we release every six months. We're aligned with the uh, cadence of the upstream OpenStack community. So our previous, uh, the stable release right now is 3.0. It was released in January of 2020. We're very, very, very close to declaring milestone three for our, 20, our July release. Um, the gating factor is integrating um, the USURI version of OpenStack. Um, we're working toward that uh, night and day right now. Hopefully we'll be declaring milestone three actually later today in our release planning meetings. So uh, the work that we've gone, that's gone into Starling X for this release is largely more about stability and um, less new features, less major architectural changes than in the previous releases. And um, we are upgrading to the latest USURI. We've upgraded to a more recent version of Kubernetes. And we've upgraded uh, the kernel to 4.18. Uh, we're using um, CentOS as the source for our kernel and user space components. Um, we've begun the process of implementing the code changes necessary uh, to allow the underlying software platform to be updated in place. Um, we're not currently supporting updates from three to four, but we're hoping to be able to enable upgrades from release four to release five. Um, we put in quite a bit of work as a community towards supporting uh, FPGAs and in particular being able to manage those devices um, through their life cycle. We have some changes that have gone in for our certificate management to improve that. We spent uh, a great amount of time and effort um, updating our documentation, improving the documentation. And then um, we had um, Kata container support is now possible. So you can now spin up um, Kata containers within the Starling X framework and manage those instances um, using Starling X. So um, we are seeing um, a growth in interest from the user community, um, but we'd also very much encourage people to please take the survey and provide us with um, data as to uh, your use of Starling X. Thank you very much. Awesome, thank you, Bruce. Next up, Monty Taylor is going to speed talk you through Zool. Because we all know that I'm really good at talking quickly. Um, hey everybody, I'm Monty. Taylor, I'm uh, one of the Zool maintainers, uh, and may you may know me from uh, from other things too. Um, so the the main thing that we want to talk about today is uh, we have an, a big sort of exciting new thing coming in Zool land, which uh, are is the Zool v4 and v5 releases. Uh, so we've been doing a lot of work to lay the groundwork for that recently. Uh, the end result of this, the Zool v5, is going to be a a more scalable and reliable. We're getting rid of the, the, the scheduler as a single point of failure, and that'll be a scale out uh, high available uh, 
uh, service component at that point. Um, Zool v4 is a transition period to get us there. There's a couple of operator facing changes that have to be made by Zool operators. Um, and so we wanted to be really clear uh, communicating these to, to people so that they could uh, continue running without any downtime and without any, without any issues. Uh, we don't want to surprise somebody with a, with a new thing. So we, we rolled out in, the, in Zool v3 support for the things that are going to become mandatory in Zool v4 that will then uh, allow us to, to roll out the, uh, the scale out scheduler feature. Um, those have all been landed in V3. Uh, we've made our final V3 release, 319. Uh, and uh, at this point, the operators should be able to roll out support for uh, ensuring that they've got a, an SQL database. It's been optional this whole time. It's gonna be mandatory in, uh, in V4 um, uh, or in, in the sort of ultimate state. Pretty much everybody's already running one. Uh, but technically, we've allowed people to run without one. Uh, and so we wanted to be really clear about that, that it was going to cease being an optional component. Uh, uh, and similarly, we rolled out support for uh, the components all talking to the, the underlying Zookeeper service uh, over TLS. And that's also going to be mandatory. Uh, so right now, we've, we've added support for it. So you can add support for that thing. Uh, but, so operators who are running need to get these, uh, these two config things rolled out so that uh, they can they can upgrade to v4 when uh, when that's ready uh, and then over the v4 life cycle we'll get all of the ha components sort of done in place uh, and then v5 should be the signal that everything is all now ha and scale out so it'd be very exciting um, uh, and that should be uh, a lot of that work is already in well in flight uh, we're just sort of being careful about how we how we land it and roll it out um, some other things that we did over this last uh, this last since last we chatted with you uh, we added a new um, a new pipeline manager called Serial uh, that was actually based on some of OpenDev's experience in doing continuous uh, continuous deployment of the OpenDev service using uh, OpenDev's Zool. Uh, and there's there's some specific cases where uh, you're running patches when changes land, but the jobs that you're running to deploy things have matchers on them to limit so that you're only running some jobs uh, when some files change, and you really need to run those in sequence. Uh, so the serial pipeline manager allows you to express that uh, to make sure that you don't um, uh, run old patches, uh, uh, old production states after you run new production states, which is usually a thing you don't want to do when you're rolling things out. Uh, we also uh, added support for managing release jobs in tree. There's, there's weirdness with triggering things based on tags uh, and knowing how those relate to branches. Uh, so we've actually added code in to be able to infer branch relationships with, uh, with tag commits so that those work as people expect them to. Um, uh, we've got better support for, uh, for streaming logs if you're running your job content in, uh, in Kubernetes uh, namespaces. Um, uh, the, the live log streaming during a job run has traditionally been a thing that's only worked in the uh, uh, SSH-based VMs. And so we've got uh, some, a better experience for our Kubernetes users there. Uh, we've got a, a nice new uh, shiny Google Compute Engine node pool driver, uh, which is in production for uh, for our friends in the Garrett community. Uh, and the GitLab uh, driver is, uh, is is rolling quite along. There's a bunch of patches in flight for it. Uh, it's I wouldn't say it's finished, but um, it's uh, it's it's definitely been uh, been cranking along, and so we're really excited about that. And uh, with that, I think I uh, I think I'm done. So thank you. Thanks, Monty. Also, just a reminder, uh, almost, like, I, actually, I think all of the projects have a user survey up. Uh, so please, if you happen to be using one of these projects, please uh, take the user survey. Next up, we will move to uh, OpenStack Foundation events updates, starting with a virtual PTG recap from Kendall Waters. Yes, thank you, Jimmy. Um, as a few of the previous speakers mentioned, we had the virtual PTG earlier this month. Um, it was the first ever virtual um, project teams gathering. It was very successful with the largest um, ever participation we've ever had with over 700 registrations. It was also the most diverse that we've ever had with um, diverse in gender, countries, and organizations. We had 44 teams meet um, with the largest sessions being Triple O, Cinder, Starling X, OSF Edge Computing Group, and Ironic. On average, there were about 25 um, people that would 
participate um, per session with uh, the highest getting up to um, around 50 or maybe a little bit higher. We used a variety of tools. Um, we used Zoom, Meetpad, IRC, um, Etherpad, and PTG Bot. Um, a few of the key takeaways that we heard from teams, it was very um, productive. Uh, of course, everyone would prefer to have it face-to-face, -face, but um, this was a, was a solid option and everyone seemed to get a lot done. Back to you, Jimmy. Thanks, Kendall. Uh, next, we've got the Open Dev event series by Ashley Ferguson. <laughs> Thanks, Jimmy. Um, hey, this is Ashley Ferguson. Um, so yeah, we are having um, an Open Dev event. Actually, the first one will be starting next week. Um, we've done this event previously, um, but this time we will be doing it virtually um, in a series um, of three different virtual events. Um, we'll be using Zoom for the first event. Um, it's intended to be a discussion-oriented um, collaborative event um, that's, that really will hit on um, some major topics within the open infrastructure community um, geared at sharing common architectures um, and collaborating around solutions to um, common challenges and problems that other people in the community seem to be facing. Um, so it's definitely intended to um, go on just, you know, not during the event, but um, after the event um, in different meetings and working groups. Um, we're hoping to have some deliverables come out of it eventually in the future. Um, but like I said, it'll be three events um, and each event will be three days um, for just three hours a day. Um, so it's pretty easy to pay attention. Um, and thank you to Platinum and Gold members for making it happen, um, as well as our awesome programming committee um, for each event. Uh, registration still open, uh, so you can register for the large scale usage event um, that starts on Monday. Um, and we also have registration open for the second two events, hardware automation and containers in production. Um, and also, if you're interested in learning a little bit more about Open Infra Labs, they will actually be um, sharing a little bit about their use case um, on Monday of this first event. So make sure to check that, if, that out if you're uh, interested. Back to you, Jimmy. Thanks, Ashley. And next up, we've got Aaron Disney. No, I don't think this one's mine. I'm next. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> it's next okay. up, we've got Allison Christ. <laughs> Hi. Um, so yes, I'm going to provide an update on the open stack days and open infra days that um, traditionally happen during the June and July summer months um, and often into um, later in the year as well. Um, but given this year, um, a lot have decided to either postpone until next year or transition to a virtual event. Um, so we've, we're creating an etherpad because um, as more and more virtual events happen and the foundation does its own virtual events, we're gaining a lot of knowledge around best practices and um, what, what we should do and what we shouldn't do. So if you've attended an event or helped organize one, please throw your best practices into that etherpad. Um, we definitely want to gather as much community input as possible as we head into another round of events later this year. And then there are actually two that are still going to be happening this year that are, will be virtual. So the first is the first cloud operator days that is going to be held by the um, Tokyo event organizers, and this is July 29th and through the 30th. Um, and they're going to be focusing on real cloud operation, and um, there's some categories here. And uh, so if you're interested, I encourage you to check out the, um, the website. And uh, I think that those will be recorded, but we can circle back with them on that as well. Um, and then the Open Infra Days China is going to be in mid-August. Um, the website is coming soon, but we will be using OpenStack.cn. So if this is a website you've been checking in on for updates in that community, we will, um, that will be a redirect soon. And their theme is going to be intelligent open infrastructure. So these are going to be the two events that um, are put on by local organizers in the community this year. But we'll continue to update the community as more make their decisions on whether they're going to go virtual or potentially move into 2021. Back to you, Jimmy. Thanks, Allison. Was that your cat? Um, also, <laughs> next, next we've got Aaron Disney. Uh, yes, this is my side. Um, we're super excited to be kicking off our content submission process for the summit this fall. Um, the first up is the programming committee nominations. We are looking for volunteers. 
Um, that is actually already live um, and you could submit, I believe Ashley sent the email out um, earlier this week um, with the link to the mailing list. You can find it there. There's also a link here um, to nominate yourself or a friend. Um, we also have call for presentations coming up very soon. We're launching that July 1st and you'll have about a month to get your sessions in. Um, and then we'll, we're also working on sponsorship and all the other details to come. But if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me or to summit at openstack.org um, in the meantime before we have more to announce. Excellent. Thank you, Erin. Uh, next up uh, is me. Uh, so be sure to um, wait. What, uh, yeah, yeah. Join the virtual events that are coming up. Uh, we've got Open Dev the um, is coming up on June 29th, uh, the first one, large scale usage of open infrastructure. And then uh, two more open devs coming up this summer, all virtual, very exciting. And uh, be sure to get involved in the 10 years of OpenStack campaign, contact Sunny, Sai, Sunny at openstack.org and tell us about your experience with OpenStack. And, uh, Yes, if you have anything to contribute to uh, Superuser, the, the blogs, any other content that you can uh, help us with, uh, please contact Allison Price. And I think I've been following along in the, uh, the chat and I believe all the questions have been answered. However, uh, if you have something that is in process, definitely feel free to take it to the mailing list. That's where everybody is. Uh, or IRC. Um, but if there's any other questions, we're going to open it up right now uh, if we miss anyone. All right. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you in September. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Bye, everyone. Thanks.